It's been said, it's not really what happens to you in life, it's what? It's how you react, it's how you respond to what does happen to you. That, in some ways, that's almost one of those, we call them secrets of life. If you can realize that, that if you can get that idea in your head, it, it changes then, ironically, how you respond or react to different things in life. As you realize, the, what, how we respond matters, or I think it's on the handout as our response matters, our response to what happens to us. And you might relate that to the idea. We mentioned both words, but sometimes there's an emphasis in distinguishing between re- responding to something and reacting. The reacting sometimes is more the, where you're not really prepared for it. You just react to what happens. Responding is more where you've, you've done what you need to do to think through things and to mature to a point to where it's more of a, an intentional decision that you make. You're more, more responsible. When it comes to Jesus, put Jesus in that category of discussion. How do I respond to Jesus? We sang this morning, what will you do with Jesus? We could sing that again tonight. I don't think Shane's going to have us sing it twice in one day. But you could make that part of the question format tonight. When you see Jesus, when you interact with Jesus. Now, we're not thinking tonight about interacting in the way that they encountered him when he was on this earth physically, as we're going to read tonight. But, it, but still, even when you read, let's say, those accounts of those encounters with Jesus, how do I respond to them? So as we look this evening at their examples, we then get to reflect on what that means for us. As we look at different ways, various ways that people in his time on earth, responded, reacted, use whatever term you like, to Jesus. From the very beginning, people had different responses. Consider his birth. You've got King Herod and his response, the Jewish leaders, the scribes that even Herod inquires with, the wise men, the shepherds. Then you have a bit later in Luke, in Luke chapter 2, you've got two individuals that are named Simeon and Anna, you see their different responses. They're similar, but different to this one who has been born. When people interact with Jesus, we see different responses, some positive, some not so positive. So let's look together at these three. If we want to get fancy tonight, don't you like getting fancy with words? We could call them arenas of thought. Or if you don't like being fancy, then just say, here's some things we're going to think about tonight. All right? Let's think together about how Jesus is, what do you put there? And you can go ahead and fill out the handout there, I guess, that Jesus is, we're going to go with awesome tonight. And maybe that's one of the few times when that word is, is really accurate. That tends to be a word we use pretty loosely, isn't it? Everything is awesome. And if everything is awesome, well, then is anything really awesome? Beside the point, just by the way, Jesus is awesome. That's, that should be the ultimate response, if we put it in words, is that when I see Jesus for real, he's awesome. But then we see people who are amazed and afraid. For the classic rock fans, again, you might think dazed and confused. That doesn't quite work, but it came to mind when I put this together. But here, amazed and afraid. And then... We'll see how people responded to Jesus both at home and as he traveled on the road. At home and on the road. All right, we're still, we're still up there. You never know what, I'm not going to name any name, but you never know what might be on the screen behind you. Let's look at that first one, the ultimate answer. How do I respond to Jesus? Jesus is awesome. There's some experiences that, unless there's something happening to deter you, you can't help but respond with something like this, with, wow. It's when you first see the Grand Canyon. And some of us in this room have been there. We've at least seen, we at least see pictures, but it, the pictures are one thing. 
It's one of those things that most people who come back, they say it was far greater and grander than, than I could have ever imagined. The pictures, the stories, the firsthand experiences just don't do it justice. I, I haven't seen many people that have gone to the Grand Canyon or similar phenomenon like that and come back saying, eh, it's okay. I know of like two people that have said that, okay? Now, I, I have seen some pictures of people that were doing this while standing at the Grand Canyon. They were on their phones. Maybe there's a lesson there about how we can develop our sense of awe or sometimes even we might do things that hinder our sense of awe. Awesome. Let's turn together to some passages of Scripture where people responded this way to Jesus. Look at Luke chapter 9 as we look at our first text that we'll read together tonight. Luke chapter 9, verse 43 to say anything about Luke 9, there is a lot going on. We're nearing for Luke. Jesus is, is, is beginning to make his final journey to Jerusalem. And so that, that explains part of why there's a lot happening in his ministry, a lot of different teachings, a lot of amazing miracles, and the, the apostles have just gone, or three of them have just had the, the opportunity to go to what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus is transformed before them. That's like in verses 26 and following in Luke chapter 9. You're coming down from that mountain, literally and metaphorically here, and Jesus is able to cast out a demon, a man that has what seems to be epilepsy that's caused by a, an evil spirit. His disciples were unable to do so. He's rebuked their lack of faith. He easily cast out the demon. And then as he continues his march toward, Jer toward Jerusalem, we read this observation from Luke in Luke 9, verse 43. It says that all were astonished. And that's a synonym I'm using for they thought Jesus was awesome. They are blown out of their, out of their minds by Jesus, by his teaching, his miracles, everything about Jesus. Jesus. And then it says, and sometimes it's thought that maybe the paragraph, the verses here don't quite align the best, but it does say in the rest of the verse that while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus then said to his disciples, and he begins to tell them more of what's to come. And they're still having difficulty figuring this out. But I notice in Luke 9, verse 43, that they were astonished at the majesty of God. They're on to something. Even the apostles don't have it all figured out at this point and won't for quite some time. But if we could tap into that to see Jesus, the real Jesus, not society's Jesus, not our Jesus, the Jesus that is even revealed in passages like this one, and be amazed at what we see as God's glory, God's power, that word majesty here is one of two words that Luke uses in this chapter that Peter, the Apostle Peter, will later use in 2 Peter chapter 1. It's not on the screen of the handout. It's just some extra credit. If you want to jot it down, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Peter uses the word ma same word for majesty. And it's when Peter is reflecting back on what happened at the transfiguration that is recorded earlier in Luke chapter 9. There's something about Jesus that is majestic that you can't help but go, wow, wow. People are amazed at Jesus. And it isn't just the disciples. It isn't just the people who were following him. It's even his enemies. Isn't that what we see in John chapter 7? Verses 45 and 46 are the two specific verses here when people are, are wanting to arrest Jesus but it, John has just told us no one would dare lay hands on him and then when the officers that were sent to do just that come back to the Jewish authorities they say well where is he to put it in our in our paraphrase what happened you're missing somebody mission failure and they their response is one of all that nobody no man ever could ever speak like this Nobody ever spoke like this man. 
even his enemies, even people that were sent to arrest him, couldn't help but be astonished and overtaken by just the way he spoke. Now, that doesn't keep him from ever being arrested. We know the rest of the story. But even among his enemies, there were certain things about Jesus that prevented them from certain actions, or at, very, at the very least, there were certain things about Jesus they could not really deny. Certain things you just can't deny about Jesus. So let's make our way now to Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 28, and then we're going to bridge the chapter break into chapter 8 for just a bit. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount as we know it over the centuries. It's Matthew's first big block of teaching from Jesus. Here's what happens after the sermon. Here's the post-sermon credit. It says in Matthew 7, 28, that when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds, and there's that word again, were astonished. Here, specifically, at his teaching. Why? For he was teaching them as one who had authority. There's our key word. And you can kind of put them together, and they, there's a ring to it, right? Majesty, enemies, authority and not as their scribes. You read back through these three chapters, and one, you do not see Jesus appealing to human tradition. You also are seeing the the one who is the author of their law. We think Moses, but really Jesus, as God in flesh, is the giver of the law of Moses, now looking at it and interpreting it and applying it, and saying, here's what you've been told, but I, Say, there's something different about the way Jesus talked. The people picked up on that. Do I? And then the first part of Matthew chapter 8 might lead us to this question. If I'm amazed at Jesus, if I agree, I'm overwhelmed by the majesty, he's awesome, what do I do about that? I suggest to you the man that comes to Jesus is a part example of what you do. You come to Jesus for help. He's got an ailment that is, you cannot cure it. It is one of the worst things to ever be die- to have as a health issue. The death sentence in so many ways, not just actual death. And Matthew says, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him, and yet behold, a leper came to him, and knelt before him. Some have the idea here of worship in mind, but he comes and he bows in this reverent way before Jesus, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So Jesus teaches with authority, and now the leper says, I'm going to come to you because I know if it's your will, if you decide to do this, it's going to happen. Because Jesus is awesome in his authority. Not just in what he teaches, but in his power over what I can't fix. And nobody else can help me take care of. That's why, in really in a brief nutshell this evening, Jesus is awesome. But that wasn't the only way people responded to Jesus. They also responded with a mixture. They were were amazed, but they were also afraid of Jesus. This one is recorded in three of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's in Mark chapter 2, it's in Matthew chapter 9, and then also in Luke chapter 5. Now in Mark 2, Mark just says the people were amazed and they glorified God. Matthew has a different take on that. Matthew chapter 9, verse 8. This is translated a few different ways. If you want to, know, if you want to discuss that, that's post-sermon. See me afterwards. But here, when Jesus tells the man he had forgiven his, of his sins to get up and walk, and he does, picks up his own bed they had carried him in with, it says in Matthew 9, 8, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid. And they glorified God, who had given such authority, we're back to that still, to men. And then you might look at Luke 5, 26 as putting it all together. You kind of get both in Luke 5. Even the phrase there that they were full of awe 
Uh, they were awestruck. That word there can is kind of the idea of being so taken back by something that there's a little fear in there. You're, you're, you're so you're so amazed at not just the beauty of something or the majesty of something, but power at work that it there's there's at least a tinge of fear. It might be the thunderstorm. You want an example? To be amazed at the beauty and the power, even then, power of God in His creation. But there can be something rather terrifying about certain storms. Especially those that produce strong, very strong winds. Those that even lead to to tornadoes or hurricanes. You take even a tornado, there's something, of course, people, we're afraid of them and, and we build shelters and cellars and to get away from them and try to survive them, but there's still something, I don't know if you want to say beautiful or amazing about that, that phenomenon. Isn't that, ta- isn't that, a, that here, that same idea? vibe, people that are amazed, but there's some fear there too. Keep going. It's the way they, the disciples in their first direct interaction with Jesus in Luke chapter 5. You might already be in Luke chapter 5 if you glanced over at Luke's account of the healing of the lame man. But look at earlier in Luke 5, Luke 5, 8 through 10, where Peter tells Jesus to leave. It reminds me of a time later when, it, it, when Jesus heals the man possessed by many demons, it's in a pagan place. And so the pagans show up, and they're only afraid. It's the extreme example. They are repulsed by this because they're, they're so afraid, they tell Jesus to leave. You've got to leave. We can't have this kind of thing happening. The apostles are a little different here. You might look at this as you apply it as, this is my response to Jesus when I, when I look at Jesus and then I happen to glance back at me and my sin, and the fact that he is so awesome, and I'm anything but. And so there might be a place here, like Peter, where it's, I don't, in a sense, I I reject Jesus, Jesus needs to leave, because he's too awesome for me. Look at Luke chapter 5, as he has performed this miracle with the fish, it says that Peter fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished, there's the amazement, at this catch of fish they had taken. And then Jesus responds to Simon and says, Do not be afraid. There's your fear. If you didn't already see that in Peter's reaction. Don't be afraid, though. From now on, you will be catching men, or you'll be fishers of men. Here's where that fear is meant to turn into service. Where when I see Jesus, I'm led to serve Jesus in the mix of all my emotions and my different responses to him. I'm amazed. I'm I'm kind of afraid because this is Jesus who can do this kind of powerful work. This is Jesus who can calm the storm later. And so there might be part of me that would appropriately say, I don't need to be around Jesus, but then the rest of me should say, no, I have to be with Jesus. Amazed and afraid. These mixed emotions show up again, mixed feelings, in Mark chapter 10. Let's read this one verse together before we we move on. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. It is parable to Luke 9, in that once again, there's a lot happening. And it's difficult. You can read this whole chapter a few times even. It's a bit difficult to figure out exactly what this fear is caused by. Is it something Jesus has said earlier about how difficult it is to get into the kingdom, back in verse 24. Is it fear of the unknown? Ever seen that? It's like the game people play where you've got three doors. And behind one door, maybe it's someone with, with a, a weapon pointed at you. The second door might be a vicious animal. The third door is just the unknown. You don't know what's behind the third door. And most people will pick one of the first two because it's, okay, I at least know what I'm dealing with. The unknown is pretty scary might be part of it here. People are picking up on things are getting serious, but maybe not serious in the way we'd like them to be. 
This is when the, the apostles that are a little closer, they're still really trying to wrap their brains around what Jesus has been predicting he's going to do. And why is he going to Jerusalem and talking about dying? Well, here's what it says, Mark chapter 10, verse 32, that while they were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them, they were amazed and those who followed were afraid. Possible the first they are the apostles and then the second group are those that are following at more of a distance saying, we don't know what's about to happen. We're not real certain. We're afraid of this, what is possibly going to happen. What does that mean? Could it be that when I meet the real Jesus, there's some things he teaches, there's some things he calls me to do, even in a way calls me to the unknown because he doesn't tell me how everything is going to happen between now and there, he just tells me the end of the story. He promises the end of the story is going to be wonderful, but he even tells me directly sometimes, sometimes more indirectly, it's implied that between here and there, Things may get bumpy. And I'm not literally going to follow him to Jerusalem when he, he's crucified, but I may follow him. If I keep following him, I may follow him in some places and some circumstances I may not be very comfortable with. And so I'm amazed by Jesus. I'm not careful. I might be a little afraid too. Amazed and afraid. It reminds me of not that long ago when a couple of children were riding with someone. I'm not going to name names once again, but they were riding and taking a, a ride in, let's call it a race car. And the first acceleration, they were, they said later they were afraid, just afraid. Then the next few accelerations, they realized, okay, this is kind of cool. And so by the time it was done, they had mixed emotions. They were a little fearful, but they were also excited and amazed. There's something about Jesus that calls us to both of those. So let's look at this last one that puts all this together, I hope. It's at home, and it's also on the road. It's the successful athlete, the sports star, who leaves his hometown and goes, and he wins the trophies, he gets the medals. And they've been hearing about him back home, and then he finally comes back home for a visit. Hometown. And for some people, they dismiss him. I remember that guy. He was the boy that, I was on his paper route. Others, it might be their expectations of what he's going to do for them. You know, maybe, maybe he can help me out. Maybe, maybe he can be a sponsor for my business. Maybe I can put my name on the back of his jersey. Jesus goes home. In Matthew chapter 13, he goes back to Nazareth. Look at Matthew 13, beginning at verse 53. Look at how they respond to the hometown boy. It says in Matthew 13, verse 53, that when Jesus finished these parables, he went away from there, and coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue, so that they were astonished. There's that again. And yet they say, this is the kind of amazement they have, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? We know this kid. He grew up just down the, the, little, the little dirt path from me. Come on. Is he not his mother called Mary? I know his parents. Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get these things? They waved the dismissal hand of familiarity and his past. And so they took offense at him. Is it ever possible to be offended at Jesus? And we look easily at the world and say, yeah, there's plenty of people that reject Jesus, the skeptic, the atheist, the, the paganist. Neo-paganism is making its way back around. But do we ever look a little closer at home? Do we beca ever become too familiar with Jesus? I know the stories. I've heard the sermons. It's just Jesus. It's just worship. It's just the Bible. And then on the other hand, it might be possible that sometimes because we think we can't get close enough, we miss out. And then we think, well, I'm not there. Jesus isn't doing a miracle in front of my face. I'm not there eating with Jesus. So I, I, I can't connect to Jesus. 
Of course, it's interesting that even people who saw his miracles that could not deny them didn't always accept him, follow him. Here's how the home bo- hometown boy receives his reception home. Of course, because of that, he doesn't do miracles in Nazareth. Consider that one. Why doesn't Jesus do miracles in Nazareth? And then we see that Jesus, early on, there's a group of people that come together in a council in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, and they begin to plot for Jesus' destruction. It's like the question, what are you seeking with Jesus? Are you seeking to follow Jesus? Well, there was a group of people in the first century that were always seeking to kill Jesus, or at least to get some way to get rid of Jesus. He's a threat to them. They're jealous of him. He's teaching things that contradict their teachings. He's drawing the crowds that they aren't getting. And on and on, their list of reasons would go that they wanted Jesus gone. I, would, I wouldn't do that. Once again, we can easily point fingers at the world. I wouldn't do that. I'm a Christian. I'm here on a Sunday evening. Could we take that one and, and ask, what if there's ever times when there are parts of my life or times of the day or people I'm with when if it were possible, I'd like to just kind of keep Jesus out of that, get rid of Jesus for that. It's possible there's a different counsel in my heart at times. But here's this last one. Let's read this one together. John chapter 6. It's an expectations issue. You've heard Rod say that you need to keep your expectations low or on zero and your acceptance high or a hundred. There might be something to that here. Because in Luke in John chapter six, verse fifteen, we read this about the people that were interested in Jesus. Jesus has fed them miraculously. They're coming back to Jesus. And it says in, in John six, verse fifteen. That perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king. And you might add there in this context, it's given away by force and make, but they want to pour Jesus into their mold of the kind of king they want him to be. Is Jesus a king? Yes. In fact, Jesus is the king of kings. But he's not the kind of king they want, and he might not be the kind of king I want. So because of that, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And then you come around to the end of John chapter 6. You pick up in verse 66. This is when they've come back for another meal. And Jesus gives them some of his most difficult sayings. They think he's calling for cannibalism at one point. And so in John 6 verse 66, here's how they respond to seeing this Jesus. Many of his disciples, these aren't the people who are loosely paying a little attention to the news about Jesus. These aren't the scribes and the Pharisees. These are people that had taken the time and the interest to become disciples, turned back, and no longer walked with him. What does that imply? They had been walking with him, disciples. So Jesus then turns to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter provides the answer to Jesus at home and on the road. When Jesus doesn't meet my expectations, when Jesus, I become too familiar with Jesus, I might need to remind myself of Peter's immortal words here in John 6, 68. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. At home and on the road, Peter knows who Jesus is, and that determines how he responds here in a way clinging to Jesus for life itself. How do I respond to Jesus? We've seen the idea, the the basic truth that Jesus is awesome. Then we explored some of the mixed emotions of people that were amazed 
and many of them at the same time were afraid. Because Jesus is so amazing and so powerful that he makes me sit up a little straighter. And that fear isn't meant to be that I walk with Jesus with a trembling hand. But it is that I respect and revere him as both my Savior who saves me from myself, but also as the creator and judge of the world. And then we saw some examples of the way that people responded to Jesus at home and on the road. Seeing Jesus, here he is. What do I do? It really comes down to two options, doesn't it? I believe they're at the bottom of the handout, not on the screen. I either reject Jesus in some way, or I revere him. I serve him, I love him, I follow him. Like Peter says they're going to do. And yes, like Peter, I may have my issues along the way, and things may be a struggle, but if I hold on to seeing the real Jesus and serving Him, it'll change things for me and for my eternity. Now we're going to sing a song together of encouragement, of invitation, calling out to one another as the Lord calls us. And that might be the decision to become a Christian and put Jesus on in the waters of baptism. It might be the decision as a Christian to turn back and really see and follow Jesus. And so we, we leave with each other with this as for the sermon. It's in John chapter 12. I put 20 through 36 on the handout. I'd encourage you to read that whole passage. But let's read this portion of it. And then the invitation is yours. In fact, would you go ahead and stand? And we'll read this together. And then you can remain standing for the song. John chapter 12, beginning at verse 20. As you read this with me, think about the question, do you want to see Jesus? John chapter, 20, verse, chapter 12, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves it loses his life, loves his life rather, loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If we can help you to see and serve Jesus, come as we, as we sing together.